yeah people start to get a little bit suspicious eh? <laughs> <laughs> um okay so i think um we've got another couple more minutes but i don't think there'll be that much harm in in kicking things off um right away so just to kind of set the scene i wanted to say thank you to everybody that has registered and is um, joining us live today this is a series of um webinars that um the team at icon have put on uh, we've put these on because uh, as Ben and I were just discussing, everybody's working from home and we're struggling, well I certainly am, with interaction. So this is an opportunity for anybody sat at home um, to reach out uh, and hear firsthand from uh, experts like Ben uh, and pose uh, any questions you have around digital experimentation, around eye tracking data, how you use that data and how you can uh, use the data to improve your digital experiences. Uh, so that's why we've done uh, these sessions. Uh, they are lasting, well, they're advertised, as we said, for 30 minutes, but people have a lot of questions. So we may be able to, to run over, uh, but there will be a hard stop um, in an hour's time. Uh, well, in 55 minutes time, let's be precise. Um, so yeah, that's really the kind of housekeeping as I said, we'd love to receive your questions, which you can submit at the bottom of your screen right there. Well, depending where the uh, icon is there, but um, you can submit your questions in that um, and I will put them to Ben um, at the end of the session in 15 minutes or so. Um, ben is joining us from Austin, Texas. He's the research director at uh, CXL Agency, as you can see on your screen there. Um, so Ben, I know of CXL um, Institute because of the content you guys produce. Um, I absolutely love the way that you're clearly experts in various different um, subjects, but you're able to translate that into bite-sized chunks. So I shared an article with Alice the other day around how um, it was messaging on websites. And it was, a it was literally just a uh, checklist of things that we can start doing and it made perfect sense. But if I was to have to go back and read and teach myself the technicals in technical ins and outs, I would have just got completely lost. So that's why I love the content that you guys produce. I know you also run um, training sessions and also um, certifications as well, which I've not done yet, but I will do in due course. Um, and I personally am very excited about this session because obviously working for a technology company uh, that predicts how people perceive um, information and how they will respond to visual stimuli, the research that you guys conduct firsthand is really, really, really interesting. Um, so we are super excited um, to hear what you've got to say and what you've got to tell us. Um, but first of all, do you want to just give us a little overview um, as to your background and what you do at CXL? Yeah, it sounds good. Thanks, Lorna. And, and thanks for inviting me here. Kind of excited to share some of, some of the research that we've done and, and some of the thinking here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a, the research director. So my role uh, with the company generally is to uh, be the starting point of how we might scope research programs for our clients if we're setting up experimentation programs there or how we might scope um, and, and develop research material or curate um, courses around research um, and, and, and experimentation programs from the practitioner instructors in our certification programs for example things like that um, so I've been with CXL four years. We were just talking a little bit about history before the call. Um, and I originally started on with the, with the Institute and I still am I'm heavily involved there and we're pushing on that. It's a, you can get cert their certification programs and courses on kind of a, a lot of things, digital marketing. Um, and that area is exploding right now and doing, doing really well. And, um, but I do most of my work in the managed services, uh, the agency part. Um, where we're, we're conducting a lot of research um, and I'll, I'll be going through some examples of some of the stuff that we've got published um, here pretty quickly. Uh, doing a lot of research for clients um, in these experimentation programs. So what I wanted to cover today is sort of a, with some, some content or, or some slides here uh, to help seed the Q&A and to get people sort of a feel is just a little bit more background on where I come from, from the research side of things. 
Uh, some of the eye tracking specific studies that, that we've done and that we mess with, um, there's some really cool visuals and stuff that we've got published um, again on, on, on the site. Uh, and then kind of go into some of these research principles um, that again, it's my kind of geek out area. So these mental models that we do all, that we kind of think about while we conduct research and how that helps us inform the experimentation. So mental model plus an example in the real world, in the real kind of experimentation marketing world of, of that. Um, but yeah, so let me just kind of jump through on that. And anyone listening, ask questions, um, Lorna, interrupt me, um, you know. Pick I will. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, a little bit of more about background on, on me. I'm, um, my background is in academia uh, at University of Texas here in Austin. I was a staff researcher for almost 10 years. And, I started out a long time ago in biology, and that led to more in the research science uh, area, where I also worked in policy and worked on a lot of uh, stuff for Department of Interior and federal government. Um, that kind of led me, there was a weird jump there into doing a lot of UX-specific research, uh, thinking about um, communication specifically, and then that led me into experimentation. And so now the tagline on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn, that's where I do a lot of communication, um, is research, experiment, and art. I do dabble um, uh, quite a bit in, in art as well as experimentation. Um, I, I think those two things kind of go together really well in a weird way. Uh, so I do, I do speaking on experimentation and research in our programs, um, and I also help manage um, programs, experimentation programs at companies like ADP, Mongo, Code Academy, Serta Simmons, uh, so Procter & Gamble, um, direct -to consumer brands as well. Um, so there'll be some examples of those um, here in a sec. Uh, so hopefully the, the material that I'm about to go through, which will, is roughly in two parts, eye tracking studies, and then these research principles with those experimentation um, program examples. Um, in terms of the eye tracking studies that I want to, get, because of this audience and I, and I quant, and I know eye tracking quite well, um, we, we've published over the last, I would say, three years, um, I don't know, 30 or 40 uh, studies. Most of them are eye tracking related. Some of them are not, but most of them, a lot of them have to do with information processing. So where is um, our attention and our awareness, and then how does that translate to recall and, and a little bit deeper information processing with, within um, kind of that awareness um, pathway. And so just to go through some examples of that, uh, I've got some slides. Um, so you know where they are if you go to our website and you go to resources, you can go to these original research studies. They are a little bit buried, but all the ones that I'm talking about are, are found here and, and there's a ton more. Not all of them are eye tracking related, um, you know, we'll do little gorilla studies like this where we measure uh, form field usability, you know, kind of a straight line form versus a, um, a stacked uh, in the real world, real world. And then we'll kind of measure out what's the completion time and things like that. And so some visuals of, of that study there. Um, but a lot of them are um, eye tracking. Um, like here's one, here's just some visuals on us and some numbers on us uh, doing a cool study looking at how people kind of react to different trust seals on through a kind of a checkout flow. Um, won't kind of geek out on some of these numbers, but we're looking at not only the fixation times and, and, and seconds to, to awareness, uh, but also that recall step. And a lot of times we're pairing up the eye tracking with uh, a, a survey of the participants of like, did you recall or what did you remember? Uh, things like that, because that kind of, connects the dots between the attention and, and how people really absorb it and how aware they are of what they, what they saw. So uh, here's one, the presentation of value proposition of benefits. We do a lot of this work um, on onset when we work with clients and uh, above the fold, um, you know, that, that storefront, you know, how are you presenting your, your, your sales proposition and, and benefits um, and things like that. Um, Here's one that relates uh, probably quite a bit back to uh, the webinar you guys did last week with, with Doug Collins and he talked about dark patterns and he had an example of a pricing grid. And uh, this one is particularly interesting in terms of how to order pricing plans. Uh, when I watched that, web that webinar video last week and I saw his criteria for what a dark pattern is, I sort of realized that just playing around with the order of, of your pricing plans 
A, it's effective and it can change the way people process um, or, or ascribe value to a particular, you know, plant package. Um, uh, but it also, according to his criteria, could be viewed quite easily as a dark pattern if you do that. Uh, so that, that, that's sort of a little bit interesting. But this is something that we have tested and continue to test with clients that do have uh, pricing pages. If you do anchor your more expensive plan over on the left, it will anchor uh, the kind of that center stage effect, the plans in the middle versus the plans on the right, the cheaper ones. It will get people um, to ascribe more value on the moderately priced plans. Um, so kind of an interesting one there. Uh, here's one that has some really nice visuals. Um, we're doing a, doing a lot of lead gen. We work with a lot of uh, B2B customers. We did a study on this uh, law firm site that's kind of a direct response uh, set up here um, and looking at sort of what, what's the eye tracking pattern with using different visual cues. So you can see the one on the top is a man looking at you and then there's a man looking at the form and then there's kind of a kind of a human drawn arrow and then kind of a, a little bit more subtle triangular arrow on the bottom. Uh, Lorna, which one do you think uh, is getting more people over to the uh, over to the form? Getting more eyeballs over to the form, I should say. To the form, um, I would say potentially the arrow. The bottom one or the one up from the that? second? Yeah, sorry, sorry, the bottom uh, second from the bottom. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, oh. So yeah, that's uh, and to give you kind of a benchmark of that, like here's the the extreme opposite of the, of the guy looking at you in terms of the, uh, the results of that. So yeah, so that, that human drawn arrow did, uh, did wonders for getting some eyeballs over, over to that form. So some interesting stuff there. Um, so yeah, so that gives you a flavor of some of the uh, eye tracking specific research that we do. And we do research on uh, with our clients on in all sorts of different ways. A lot of UX benchmarking work, a lot of surveying polls, codification of chat log types of codification analyses in general, uh, user testing, um, user testing at scale, copy testing, stuff like that. Um, but generally my setup is working with these clients and, and doing research. And so I wanted, what I wanted to fly through real quick is just some mental models around um, how we think about research. Uh, because I, I can throw tactics at you and I will here, I'll show some examples. Uh, but the mental models really set up a nice lattice for how to think about research when, when affecting the layouts and messaging on websites or anything really. But when, you know, you don't want to just kind of throw research at, just for, for, for collecting data sake, right? You, you want to do it in a, kind of in, in, a, in a structured, intelligent way. Um, so yeah. So mental model number one, um, this is one of my favorites. Um, it's it's know, knowing the name of something is not the same as, as knowing something. Uh, this comes from Richard Feynman, um, and it really speaks to the, the idea of system one versus system two, the reptilian brain versus mammalian brain. It, it also speaks to why we really suck at, at communicating and marketing and, and using voice of customer data. So we think, for example, that the product is what we sell. And so when we, when we create a landing page for a product, we put the product at the center of it. Uh, but it's actually not what we sell. Uh, you have to ask your question, like, did Kodak sell film? Uh, did the record industry sell records? No, they didn't. And they thought they did. And um, they were wrong. And they made the mistake of that. And it, this, this speaks to jobs theory. Uh, if you're familiar with the jobs to be done framework, people hire the products to fulfill a job. And the classics job to be done cases the, you know, why do you need a drill? It's not to put a hole in the wall. It's, it's because you need beautiful art on your wall. Like that's why you do it. So an example of this, it's a brand that we work with at Procter & Gamble. Uh, this is a very expensive deodorant brand, um, not, not as needed in, in these days maybe, but um, it's, a, it's a natural, better for you type of deodorant. Um, there's, you know, there's no, no products in there that, that cause you harm, right? It's 12, 12 US dollars for a stick of deodorant, which is quite a bit. It's very expensive. And, and so you look at the value proposition, deodorant to stay fresh and clean. Do I pay $12 for a stick of deodorant to stay fresh and clean? No, 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 I don't. That's not their value proposition. Uh, that's what they think that they sell, but that's not what they sell. For them, let's change that up. Deodorant without the chemistry experiment. 
that's why people sell or buy a $12 stick deodorant because they don't want to pollute their bodies, right? Um, so the product is not what you sell. The feeling is what you sell. So that mental model, the name of something is not the same as the something um, is it, really important. And when you're thinking about research and, and crafting value propositions, that's, it can be really vital. So the next mental model is, is this is one of my favorites. Knowledge is experience plus sensitivity. Um, the example here I give is, is, um, is like my se I have a seven year old son, eight year old son. And, and if I let him try, and I did let him try wine for the first time like a, about a year ago and he spit it out and he, he said, that's really gross. And I said, do you know wine? And he says, yes, I know wine. It's really gross. Uh, and so that's it. That, that's his experience with it. And so he's all wine has the same taste and it's really bad. Um, but it's, that's not true. As you know, um, he had an experience, but what he doesn't have is the sensitivity to how that, um, how that wine is across a breadth of experience. This mental model is where best practices and tactics go to die. Uh, so knowing a best practice or guidelines for how you set up a well converting checkout doesn't mean you can apply it for every business, every customer, every industry, every vertical. Um, if I throw at you like 12 guidelines for, for setting up an e-commerce homepage design uh, for furniture, uh, which is a high consideration time type of product, um, it's actually more analogous to diamond rings than it is to deodorant. Um, uh, you know, it just won't work. You know, these tactics need to be sensitive to, to, to how uh, that piece of information is across a breadth of exp um, experiences. Um, so how does this work, work in real life? Here's a really common example of a landing page for a, a, a kind of a SaaS, you know, a SaaS type of landing page. You come in, you get a value proposition, you see a couple CTAs, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, you know, you can watch a video, but the real common thing is right here, you know, get a custom demo. And it's real popular. If you go to Zoom or, or, or Airtable or, or, um, or Slack homepage, they're all set up just like this. And, and what's, what's interesting is the more complex the product, the more handy this little email field is. If it's a real easy product, if it's something like an online whiteboarding uh, company, um, you know, you understand really kind of what it is and maybe you just need to go right into it and that's fine. But the more compli complicated a, pr a product, and this is kind of a, um, this is a, if you're not familiar with it, this is a customer data platform, um, which is quite complex. Uh, so the more complex a, a product, the more friction you can actually add to your landing page to get someone not to take the immediate action, but to get them to scroll down, wade through some of the value that's there below, and then come back up and say, okay, I'm ready to take that action. If you were to remove this email field, you would see conversions probably drop because that added friction actually helps. So this is a case where best practice, removing form fields, removing friction, can actually backfire. Um, so again, knowledge plus experience, um, uh, knowledge equals experience plus sensitivity. You have to understand how and be sensitive to how a piece of information is across a breadth of experience before you have, have the true knowledge of how it works. Um, that actually looks very similar to um, our call to action in, on our previous website. Um, and we were just, um, when I first started, we were just um, receiving inbound after inbound after inbound requests because the sheer volume of them, there wasn't any of those barriers. Um, so then we started, uh, once we launched the new website, um, uh, the progressive profiling. So do yep. like gathering parts of information where it's relevant based on what you're providing in exchange. Um, which building out from scratch was absolutely, was very, very complicated. But I'm glad to see that I thought where you were going with this is the complete opposite to what we've done. And I was like, oh, oh take notes. But I'm, I'm really relieved to see that that's something that I know firsthand um, we've had to kind of play around with and test. Yeah, and that's, that's actually, that's what you referred to kind of takes this to the next level, right? Where you're starting to collect that zero party data. Like, mm. what kind of company are you? What's your budget? What's this? Like, what industry are you in? Um, are you small business or enterprise? That's that zero party data that then is, becomes super powerful to personalize uh, the experiences and, 
and qualify and, and also for the user, increase their perception of um, that they will be successful as they keep going down that, that, that path, right? Um, which is, is really key. So. Yeah, I like to think it's mutually beneficial, right? So if, yeah. so I've, I've, I've done it, obviously having marketing budget, I'll go onto SaaS platforms and look to inquire around having demos and things like that. Quite often, um, they'll have an automation to qualify me out based on budget. So I don't want to have gone down a long uh, sales cycle speaking to sales consultants if, in fact, I don't have a large enough budget to buy the solution in the first place. So I like to think that companies are using tools and tactics like this to be mutually beneficial. Yeah, and a lot of times when you present like that, that framework and like, okay, I want to add steps, I want to add... I want to add screens and URLs. Your marketing team's like, no, 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 wait a minute. We want no friction. Like, uh, so it goes against so, so, sort of some of the best practice uh, ways of thinking. Yeah, definitely. I think it's not to labor this point too much, but this is kind of against what you've just said there is against most marketers' KPIs. So we want as many leads yeah. as possible. Okay, we'll drop all of the data entry and we'll just get email addresses. But then that's a complete disjoint between marketing and sales. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's really, really interesting. I've been, certainly been firsthand in those meetings where people are like, well, okay, then we'll just drop every single barrier, but then that's not actually the solution that either the customer or the business wants. Yep. Yeah, certainly. Cool. So kind of blowing through these on, on some of my other talks, I've got a lot more examples that, uh, that kind of illustrate some of these, but, um, kind of going through here pretty quick. So. Mental model number three, uh, answers are meaningless until you have the question. This speaks to data traps. Uh, we love to collect data, we love to do research, and, and um, collecting data for data's sake can be really, really dangerous. Uh, because all of that data doesn't mean anything until, until you have a good question. And, and that, should, that should resonate for people that have a data science team that are just waiting for the questions to come in. They can collect data all the time, but unless they have direction and leadership with the right direction or with the right questions, then uh, they're not very effective. Um, for us, uh, the work that we do with experimentation programs uh, is mostly around uh, the marketing site and understanding sort of that customer experience and how to change that customer experience. So the questions are not, um, um, they're, they're quite specifically around the audience and, and, and there's four buckets that we like to use, perceptions, behaviors, motivations and anxieties. Um, these, this is our, I would say, uh, voice of customer playbook. Uh, and when we come in and onboard, we, we look at these things separately and have specific tools to get at the questions, um, uh, to get answers for the questions here. Uh, so to know perceptions, we love to use UX benchmarking. To, to know behavior, we use a lot of user testing types of um, activities. To know motivations, there's surveying and goal uh, types of activities. So being very surgical on how you're answering the question, but starting with the question and not just, again, running with, with, with uh, data collection for data collection's sake. Um, so kind of a, our standard rubric. And I've got a ton of material that goes into a lot of detail on each of these, but I'm skipping that for now. But I will kind of geek out. I think I threw a few slides on here on the UX benchmarking part, because when you put out this announcement for this lunch and learn, you. I think you mentioned on how to collect user, um, user experience data as one of the points. Um, and so I will say like an NPS question is that is a classic uh, UX benchmark that people are, are used to. How likely are you to, to recommend? But uh, I plead to, to everyone out there that there are other uh, UX benchmark questions um, around credibility, for example, appearance, uh, usability, these all together um, represent a standardized a survey called the Super Q, uh, developed for Jeff Sorrow out of Measuring You. It's sort of analogous to a system usability score, but meant to identify those dimensions of user experience on dig with digital experiences um, like websites, um, not just kind of you know software systems. Um, we worked with Jeff then to add a fifth dimension to the Super Q uh, message clarity. Uh, we do a lot of conversion rate optimization type of work. So sales propositions and, and, and things like that, how clearly you should buy from one store instead of another. So your NPS is only one metric. 
you can track a lot of these types of things analogously. Um, the bang for the buck, this website is easy to use. Uh, the, the data here is gonna explain 80% of what all of these other dimensions explain. Uh, so an interesting thing there. Uh, I think I threw a slide of like, yeah, we, we published something recently on, on um, doing this type of work, doing this, this type of study at scale in a competitive sense and, and benchmarking for beauty and e-commerce sites uh, so you could see sort of how these sites dip, um, kind of fall out with each other and, and how some sites need to work on some different aspects relative to each other. Um, yeah, so kind of a, a brief taste on that. Go ahead, Lorna. Are they, um, so the uh, responses from a questionnaire or survey that you sent out, is that right? This is like user testing at scale. Okay. Uh, so send, you know, user testing with like 100 people. And you're not watching videos in this case. Uh, rather, you're, it's a, you know, you're getting a panel, uh, you're sending them through uh, digital experience, buying experience, and then you're setting the, uh, a large question set survey after, yeah. Okay, and so it's done remotely then? Yes. Yes, yep. okay, cool. So you could do it, moder you know, in person, but you're talking to 100 people, so it's not, yeah, you can do it remotely, get a panel, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mental model number four, it's not enough to know. Um, and this kind of speaks to what's known in academia as an implementation crisis. Um, there's a whole field of science, and you can Google Scholar this, uh, called knowledge transfer science. Um, we can assess, we can collect data all day long, we can make plans with that data, but until it's implemented, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and this is across sciences and, and not just marketing. Uh, this is, this, again, there's, there's a whole field of science out there called knowledge transfer, getting the data and the knowledge uh, that's, a, that's collected through research and, and actually applying it in the field. Um, in this case, in a marketing sense and, and thinking about our customers, you know, we can collect data on what their perceptions are or what they're thinking, but we, um, you know, it doesn't really help. We have to show that we understand. We have to put it into context. You can hold the door open for somebody, but if they just walk by you, it doesn't do any good as, as, as an example. And so getting it um, um, uh, applied, experimenting is, is the key here. Experimentation is the tool that we use as the bridge between the research we collect and the change that we want to see happen. Because we're looking to change customer behaviors, change customer perceptions. Uh, experimentation is that bridge to implement um, and to get it on the site and, and to learn from if that research was effective or not. Um, and then and a research study, when you're implementing research, you have to do it in the right way, putting the questions in the right spot. Uh, so from just on the research side, actually implementing uh, correctly can make sense. Uh, this is an example from like a, uh, from a SAS CX journey, you have to implement the right question in the right time. Um, and then from a site perspective, um, you're learning where people are, or how people are interacting with, uh, with the site. You know, this is that native deodorant example again. Um, we couldn't affect conversion rate here because people were highly motivated. It had really high conversion rate. But what we could affect was the perception of the value of the product and, and cross-sells and upsells. And so tinkering with that, asking people what they felt about um, uh, the offerings and then that led to packages that led to other offerings, uh, that's really where we were able to apply a lot of the research, not in helping out the conversion, um, but we affected revenue by affecting uh, average order value and lifetime value with these cross sells and upsells and, and, and really tinkering, perfecting the timing when they pop up, when they come up uh, and, and things like that. So it's not only that you know that, that you know, people value something and they would like more of it, but um, flexing on that knowledge and, and, and packaging and, and experimenting and doing it in different ways for different segments and things like that. Um, that's where you, really where you're going to success. success. Um, we're hitting close to the 30 minute mark. I've got some more, a little bit more on this kind of like um, uh, this last one, but I think I'll stop here because this kind of sums up the, the, the uh, knowing is not enough mental model. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think I'll stop here and, and exit out on this. And okay. A great uh, end to it. I hadn't actually thought about it and I guess it's because most of um, CROs, so conversion rate um, optimization specialists, 
kind of look at it from, it might be a blanket statement, but the conversion, right? You want to impact yeah. that conversion. It, this is the first time that I've actually thought about looking, taking a step back and thinking about the broader conversion. So what, what does the, what are you actually looking for? And it's not an increase in clicks. That's just one person's kind of KPIs for the business. You're looking to add greater value to a consumer because then you do get the opportunity to upsell, cross-sell. Um, and I think that's when you get into more sophisticated experimentation, right? You have to have the tracking code um, and also the hypotheses and the thinking around um, omni-channel testing. So whether it's the email campaigns, whether it's the recommendations, et cetera. Um, so that, I think that was a really, really valid um, and interesting point personally. Um, so thank you very much for sharing um, that content with us. Um, we did have a couple of questions as we were going through, but I didn't want to stop because I was actually taking notes for myself. Um, but I can go back now. I think the question, um, one of the first questions that came in was when you were showing the uh, eye tracking uh, simulations or the eye tracking results, sorry. Um, the question is, um, this person is new to U uh, UX, um, there's no such thing as a silly question, um, but uh, can you predict what people would look at or would you say you should always be testing live? Uh, I think you can predict what they're going to look at. I mean, a model is a model. And so even if you test live with participants, you're gathering a statistic, which is an estimation of what that would truly be with the population. It's still just a model. Uh, so they're very analogous. Like if you're using an algorithmic way to do a prediction versus a small subset of, of live people, um, they're, they're very similar in terms of, um, or, or there's analogous issues with the confidence that you can rely on it for, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, they're, they're, they kind of can go hand in hand. And just depending on your resources and, and, um, and what you've got set up in the systems and, and budgets, you might pick one versus the other. Yeah. Um, I'd like to comment on that because that's exactly what I want us. So <laughs> I imagine now we've got the, uh, your contact details, one of our sales team will be um, responding back to that individual directly. Um, but yeah, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. That's what I, I like about iQuant so much. It's the ability to use the data to predict. Um, and it comes back to we as human beings, I think, like to think that we have ultimate uh, control over choice, how we select information, how we process it. But in reality, there's a huge body of research that suggests that we respond in a very predictive way to say, for example, visual stimuli. So there are definitely different tools and techniques to be able to predict how people are going to uh, react to changes in stimuli. Um, you mentioned um, earlier around um, the remote testing. Uh, what other tools do you use um, to be able to gather um, user data? Oh, so for, for remote testing, um, there's, I mean, there's tools like iQuant that you can do it in a, in a, in a simulated way. There's, uh, you know, there's online eye tracking tools where you could do it in a, in a panel um, as well. There's, um, you know, but in, in terms of the surveys and the user testing side of things, we're using, you know, for user testing, you can use tools like usertesting.com, Validate, the Userlytics, Try My UI, UserBob. There's a ton of those competitors out there doing that type of stuff. Um, we also, we geek out on this uh, and create our own panels uh, through different tools in Europe, uh, using a tool like ClickWorker in the US, using like Amazon MTurk, which is quite robust and, 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 and quite massive and frankly, a lot of these other user testing tools are cr getting their panels from MTurk, the APIing into MTurk to, to create and curate their custom panels. Um, I know this because we do this with our, our, ourselves. We have a, a product called copytesting.com. Um, it's in beta right now, but you can go and sign up and use it uh, where it does something analogously for your copy is what user testing does for um, sort of a, a a more full funneled digital experience. Uh, but just in terms of the copy, uh, sitting, sending a panel of people through it to, to, to do markup on what resonates, what doesn't, uh, with a statistical model behind it to, to kind of analyze you know, what's, what's working and what's not. Um, 
so, so these panel providers, you can also use professional panel providers like Scent, Peanut Labs, uh, things like that. Um, but those ones are like ClickWorker and, and MTurk are really nice bang for buck for, for doing a lot of the gorilla testing that, that for example, a lot of the, the eye tracking that you, that you saw, some of those studies that we've done where we're doing the form analysis, we use panels like that. Um, and there's also tools like uh, um, Optimal Workshop that allow us to, to you know, set up and do click maps and, and, um, and send people through that. And survey tools is, is a big one. So when we do the UX benchmarking, using a, a tool like SurveyMonkey um, is, is really helpful for that. And then when, when we're working with our clients and, and more enterprise, uh, we're trying to bake in those processes and bake in voice of customer uh, data collection and processing. We're using enterprise tools like uh, Usabilla. Uh, there's a new cool tool out there called UserLeap. Um, that, that, that's a really great one that I love. Um, processing tools, um, codification tools like Chattermill, uh, Amazon Comprehend that does the natural language processing and codification, topic modeling. Um, I can I can go on and on. There's a, there's a few tools then I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question that's come through: um, How big does the team need to be um, in order to set out like an experimentation program? Um. Well, you can outsource a lot of it. I mean, so you could be a team of one and outsource some of the, if you're just the program manager at a conceptual level, you're, you're, you're working with the site, you're, you know, you can do some guerrilla testing using free tools like Google Optimize. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using a visual editor. You can outsource some technical um, help there in terms of, of getting that done. There's a lot of firms out there that are, are, are just focused on that. Um, and so just depending on the budget there, a team of one or two uh, could work really well. If you are more, you know, if you can work with JavaScript and, um, and CSS pretty well, then, um, uh, then you can be a team of one as well. Okay, cool. Um, I, th I think, well, when people hear about um, digital experimentation and as you've just listed off there, hundreds almost of tools, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So I think it is good to, to know that you can, number one, outsource it if you need to and if you have got budget, but also that you don't have to embark on a huge, huge program. As you said, you can chunk it down and start at different sections in the user journey using a variety of more cost-effective um, tools. So I think that's reassuring to know that you don't have to have a huge enterprise team working for the company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cool. Um, and then uh, we've got one on how um, have you used eye tracking data in the past to improve digital experience? Yeah, so some of those studies that we showed earlier with regards to the, uh, those eye tracking studies, like the, how people are, are, you know, how different visual cues affect people's attention and then recall, uh, that helps us sort of understand some of that. Uh, I think most recently, a lot of that price table work uh, so reordering price plans, um, recommending like how you set up like a recommendation um, uh, label or, or, or highlighting of a particular plan and, and, and how that's presented. Uh, that's really um, directed a lot of our thinking about, about what tests to set up with our clients. And, and, and we've seen a lot of wins for, um, uh, because of that. Um, and and then, I mean, we've, we've, there's some studies, uh, some examples in there around social proof, like what social proof works best to grab your attention mm -hmm. and then to result in recall of that social proof. So is it a testimonial, just text? Is it a testimonial with a headshot? Is it uh, press logos? Is it, um, you know, so things like this, you know, doing it from a very academic stance at first and then applying it with our clients and playing around with that to validate. Um, you know, in the real world in a particular spot. Yeah, so like testimonials without a headshot, not as effective. Get that head, human headshot on there. It grabs attention, it holds attention, it leads to better recall. Um, yeah. But you'll see loads of headshots now appearing everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so that is it for the questions. And I know um, we're on um, a fixed time. So um, I wanted to say thank you so much um, for running us through that, that content and asking and answering those questions for us. Yeah.
Um, and also, um, as I said at the beginning, this is a um, series that we're running. So we will be running one next week, I believe is with Kat from Winderman and Thompson. Uh, and she's going to be providing tips on uh, conversion rate optimization specifically for e-commerce. So if anybody cool. has liked this one, and obviously Ben, it'd be great if you could come along as well. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot. I've got a whole notepad here of tech to go and research, research papers to have a look at from the um, blog section or research section on the website. Uh, so final thank you and um, I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, thank you, Lorna. We'll talk Thanks. soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.